Welcome to everyone to this webinar on African challenges to multilateralism, denial between history, conflict and cooperation. I'm Daniela Huber, head of the Mediterranean, Middle East and Africa program at YAI, and I have the honor to briefly open this web webinar on one of the most iconic rivers of this world in the context of climate change and water scarcity the shared and sustainable management of transboundary rivers like the Nile is becoming ever more important. And today in this webinar, we are giving voices um, to local perspectives from the three uh, key riparian states, that is Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt on this topic. We are all extremely happy, I have to say, for the great interest this webinar is generating. So thanks to all of you for joining us today. Uh, the webinar is part of a research project supported by the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Compagnia di San Paolo Foundation, a strategic partner of YAI. And we are also delighted to hold this webinar in cooperation with the History Department of the University of Turin and the Egyptian Museum in Turin. This cooperation is certainly to be continued. So without further ado, I would like to give the word to our partners for the welcome remarks. Uh, uh, before giving the word to them, um, please make sure your microphones are closed so we don't have background noise and hear the speaker as well. And let me also add that this webinar is um, recorded. So uh, without further ado, I give the floor now to Lorenzo Kamel, who is Associate Professor in the History Department of the University of Turin and Director of the YAI Research Studies. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Daniela. And I will be very brief. I just want to, to thank the Daniela Uber, Natalie Champion, Francesca Caruso, the team at YAI, and with them also Nicolò Russo Perez, uh, Compagnia San Paolo, my colleague Stefano De Martino, the director of uh, the Egyptian Museum, Christian Greco, and uh, also all the speakers that are joining us from, uh, from different countries of, of Africa. Uh, it's a great privilege to co-organize this meeting and to hear uh, your, your voices. Uh, as we wrote uh, in the abstract of this conference, since the, mm, sort of the down of recorded history, the Nile is considered uh, the lifeblood of, of Egypt and also neighboring country. And uh, still today, the Nile remains uh, the, really crucial for the agriculture, but also for tourism in the whole region. So in light also of what is happening in, uh, in Ukraine, uh, Russia, and so on, it would be important to try to understand the impact of all of, all of that uh, also on the, uh, on the dam, uh, on the so-called Great Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, and the agriculture-related aspects. It's enough here to mention that Egypt is the top importer of wheat. 85% of the wheat supplies come from Russia and Ukraine. Um, so it's really important to look at history, the relevance of the Nile in history. At the same time, uh, the repercussion of the present on agriculture on the neighboring countries. Uh, so once again, the past and the present and the other way around. Uh, in this respect, this was always the aim of this conference, to connect the past and the present. So I leave now, without further ado, uh, the floor to uh, Nicolò Russo Perez from Compagnia di San Paolo, and I look very much forward to, to hear all the speakers. Thank you very much. Thank yes, thanks, uh, Lorenzo. And indeed, next speaker is uh, Nicolò Russo Perez, the coordinator of the International Affairs Program at the Compagnia di San Paolo Foundation based in Turin. Thanks, Nicolò. Thanks a lot and thanks to all of you. Welcome to all the participants who are joining us today. Uh, I would like to first thank all the institution, the Instituto Affari Internazionale, which is a long-term strategic partner of the Compagnia di San Paolo, uh, the University of Turin, in particular the Department of uh, History, uh, the Egyptian Museum, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. So a special thanks to, of course, to the organizer, Daniela Huber and Lorenzo Camel, who are the driving force behind uh, these initiatives. Thanks to Stefano De Martino, thanks to Christian Greco, uh, 
thanks to Francesca Caruso and all the speakers that are joining us today. Um, I'm Nicolò Russo Perez, I'm in charge of the international activities with the Compagnia di San Paolo Foundation. We are a private foundation based uh, uh, here in Torino. Um, the roots of the foundation goes back uh, to 1563. So we are a rather old institution and now we are a private foundation and actually one of the few foundation in Italy with a quite relevant international activities also. So we operate uh, both at the grant making level and also operationally at the international level. What we do internationally, we try to combine uh, uh, research activities, support to policy oriented research. Uh, we try to support, uh, uh, let's say, outreach activities. So towards uh, uh, the policymakers, but also students and, and uh, the broader public. And of course, uh, we support uh, uh, training, uh, training activities, both uh, uh, thanks to the support that we provide to the university in Turin, but also, for instance, to the United Nations uh, campus. So we have a large uh, United Nations campus here in Turin with three UN agencies that are providing uh, uh, quite important um, uh, training programs. Um, in terms of topics, we try to be, let's say, aligned uh, with the main posture of the foreign policy of Italy. So we have strong focus on the, uh, let's say, European dimension, European integration. We have a strong uh, transatlantic dimension. And uh, last but not least, we have a strong focus uh, uh, on the Mediterranean. As, a, as, as the key area where, where it, Italy has, has, has traditionally been, been very active. We try to be aligned, as I said, but also a little bit provocative uh, in terms of uh, promoting some lateral thinking, exploring, uh, like in the case of the seminar that we are starting today, uh, topics that are relatively uh, little covered in the, in the mainstream media. So uh, we try to be, uh, let's say, uh, provocative, but also long-term and try to understand uh, uh, the key structure that are uh, developing at the international level and that can help uh, us uh, and the public uh, to better understand uh, uh, what's going on at the, uh, on the international relations that we are uh, facing. So without further ado, thank you very much again. And uh, I look very much forward to listening and to learning from, from, from all of you today. Thanks. Thanks a lot indeed, Nicolo, for your support. And I think the, um, the participation in this webinar speaks for itself that there is indeed a lot of interest in these topics. I would just like to add that on the side of YAI, the driving forces have really been Francesca Caruso and Natalie Champion. So all the uh, credit on the side of YAI uh, uh, goes to them. Now, let me give the word to Stefano Di Martino, who is professor at the University of Turin and Director of the Center for Archaeological Research and Excavation of Turin for the Middle East and Africa. The floor is yours. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am a colleague of Professor Kamel, but my field of research is far away because I work on the history and documentation of the Middle East in the second millennium before Christ. Despite this, I am always very happy when Professor Kamel involved me in his events and projects, and it's a privilege for me collaborating with the EI. Um, what are rivers and water supply uh, played a significant role in the ancient Middle East. It's not by chance that the first state emerged in the uh, Nilus Valley, Mesopotamia and the uh, Indus Valley. And also in the antiquity, uh, there were a lot of conflicts uh, between the polities uh, for the control over, over the water, the construction of dams or changing the cross of the river determined the situation of economical emergency and political crisis. So um, the workshop of today is not only uh, very actual and involved the contemporaneity, but it's very interesting also for the historians of the antiquity. I don't want to take time uh, to the speakers. I can't wait uh, to listen to all the lectures today. on behalf of the University of Twitter. I want to thank again all the speakers and the institution who support this event, uh, particularly the EI, the Compagnia di San Paolo, and the Egyptian Museum Foundation. I thank you very much for your attention, and I hope that the audience will enjoy this workshop. I will for sure. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Di Martini for being on board of this. Um, indeed, if please everyone could keep the microphone uh, closed. So because sometimes there's background noise. 
Um, now, we are now particularly delighted to kick off this event with a keynote speech by Christian Greco, who is the director of the Egyptian Museum of Turin. So, um, Christian Greco, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, and uh, uh, well, I would like, first of all, to thank the uh, organizers <laughs> and uh, Professor Kamel, and particularly to uh, having asked the Museo Egizio. Uh, to be part of one of the partner organizer, uh, Professor De Martino and the IA, uh, IAI um, for this uh, talk uh, this morning. Um, I, I hope I can give a very humble contribution that have given me like the impossible tasks to uh, talk about the role of water uh, and the Nile in Egypt uh, through history and to do that within 15 minutes, uh, you can imagine it is rather complex. Um, so I have decided to, um, well, try to give an overview of what this mean for especially Theban archaeology, uh, having to deal with water nowadays and what the now has represented very briefly, of course, in history. I don't have the aim to be complete. It would be impossible to be complete in 15 minutes, but just to give you an overview. Well, we all know that Egypt was defined by Herodotus, Doron to Nelu, the gift of the Nile. We don't even know whether Herodotus did it himself, or this was an expression done by Hecataeus, who Herodotus then quoted. We don't, we are not even sure. There is a lot of debate whether Herodotus, so the Greek uh, writer of the sixth century BC, who wrote, who is considered the father of history, or devoted the entire second book to Egypt, we don't even know whether he went to Egypt or uh, he re-elaborated on uh, some writings of Ekataios. What we do know is that from a material culture, the role of the Nile is important. And we see many kind of objects attesting this. You see, for instance, this wonderful faience container where on the side there is this representation of the Nile happy, the representation of the inundation, with bringing offerings, and you see how is also represented with quite heavy breasts, is the fertility and life that comes from water. Or we have the so-called nun containers, where we see that from the original chaos and from water, life was born. We have different cosmography attesting how uh, life came into be into Egypt from the one of Heliopolis. Uh, this is uh, a picture taken from one of the most important coffins we have at the Museo Egypt, so the one of Butamo, where we see the goddess Nut. We see uh, line the god a gap, so Nut is the sky, gap is the earth. We are separated by Shu, is the god from the atmosphere, from where union life came into being. But we also know that there is the so-called Hermopolitan uh, cosmography where it's talked about the eight deities who swam all the way to Thebes, to Medina Tabu, where the word came into being. And you see here the small Amon temple with the precinct of the temple of Medina Tabu and the representation of the time of Tutmosis III of the importance of this temple of being the source of life coming into being. Having to deal with denial, having to deal with the inundation was part of uh, the daily life in Egypt. The year was divided into three main seasons, and the season of the inundation was very important. Moreover, the Nile was uh, the only wave of communication that allowed to go from north to south. We are here in Aswan, uh, in the island of the Elephantina, where actually a change had to take place to go more to the south. There were the so-called cataracts, so it was not possible to keep um, uh, going, to keep sailing to the south, and other ways had to be uh, found. We know, for instance, from the inscription of the tomb of Harkuf of the sixth dynasty, that travels through the desert had to be arranged, carrying water, since the now starting from Aswan southward could not have the role that he had from here northward. Uh, what is really amazing still nowadays when you go to Egypt is to see the strict demarcation 
of the fertile land compared to the desert. To see where water comes and water can create lives. We are here in Thebes. We see the huge temple of the Ramasim, who is on the verge. By the way, the temple of the Ramasim has all this mud brick structure, uh, which are store rooms which were meant to collect uh, grain and wheat for, uh, uh, for the old population in the um, system of the redistribution economy, which was centered on the temple. So you see how the division of fertile land into terraces and different level is important to allow the growing of different plants. And we see it also represented in New Kingdom representation when we see here, for instance, the use of the shaduf uh, meant to go down, collect water and go up to, uh, uh, to different levels and to different plants and flowers that could uh, um, be supported by water. The presence of water for agriculture is constantly present in, uh, in the representation. We see here why is water important, is water for sailing and navigation, but of course is water for all kinds of production, in this case, wine production. And you see how of the water, how life is born. These offering ladies are bringing on the offerings from bread to grapes, thanks to the fact that the Nile is there. And water is the very essence of life, as we see in this coffinet representing a libation where the goddess is in a sycamore tree and she's giving water. And we see some parts of the beautiful New Kingdom uh, um, gardens that were developed and life that could develop within the gardens themselves. Inundation, water, life, offerings and sustainability of the economy, as we have seen in the first container I showed you a few minutes ago. Let me bring you to the third intermediate period and go inside the temple of uh, uh, Luxor. Uh, what you see here in a, a drawing made by Goldvan in 1881, uh, how the temple of Luxor is quite of a complex uh, building itself. You have different parts built in different periods. So you, you have uh, what is in red is the Ramasite period. What is in green is the, uh, the part built by Hamenotep III. And in the solar court of Hamenotep III, uh, just to the southern part, there is an inscription uh, dated to King Osorkon II, related to the inundation. And we read, the flood swells over the dikes of the entire land, as in the first time. The first time in ancient Egyptians means the time of creation. It's called in ancient Egyptian Septepi. As in the first time, it rose over the river banks. No man may, no man made them can hold off its ravage. All people are like ducks. The inhabitants of this city are like swimmers in a wave. So actually, Osorkon II is reporting about a very devastating um, inundation which affected Thebes. And he goes on. This is their cry in the sky towards Ra. As this great god reaches the beautiful island and goes to rest in the holy shrine. What can human understand? Happy, so the inundation, the, 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 um, the Nile god, enter as you have ordered. Why then is, is he filling your temple to his death? rise and appear in Thebes. So you see, actually, the prey to Amun to come and help and rescue because the inundation has been too much and is putting into danger what is happening. I would like to uh, make a big jump to uh, the 1970s and show you actually what happened when President Gamal Abdel Nasser uh, decided to uh, built the second high dam, Aswan dam, for the creation of the Nasser Lake. I'm not going to talk because I'm not competent in that on uh, uh, what kind of change it meant in terms of demography, uh, energy creating, sustainability, uh, and agriculture. Um, but I want to show you how is the effect on archaeology, how water management still nowadays is very important to what actually affects the monument. So uh, the dam was created, and we all know there was this huge UNESCO campaign to uh, rescue 
the temples. I should underline to rescue the temple, but not to rescue uh, archaeology and not to rescue mm -hmm. settlement archaeology because we lost enormous, uh, we, know, we lost very, I'm sorry, uh, we lost uh, actually many uh, villages and we lost the knowledge of very important vital moments in the Nubian history. You saw the temple of Abu Simbel, this is the temple of Phile, which was moved, this is the temple of Kalapsha, and uh, uh, that was, uh, the, the temple were moved, uh, there was not enough time uh, to, to document them, and um, a lot of archaeological evidence was um, lost in a pattern that we see in Egypt uh, since a long period. Here is a beautiful picture of James Harry Brestas, the founder of the Oriental Institute in Chicago, in his beautiful studio. I see uh, Stefano De Martino uh, noting this is like the, the office we all would like to have. It has an erratic papyrus in front, a Greek inscription, uh, uh, um, um, Akkadic inscriptions. It's like, you know, well, the symbol of what Brestas did. And what did he do actually? He created the so-called Chicago House, who I've been so honored to be part of uh, for many years in Luxor, to document. And he was saying there is a stressing amount of damage suffered by the monuments since the early recording expedition had worked on them. It was a supreme obligation of the present generation of Orientalists to make a comprehensive effort to save for posterity the enormous body of fast perishing written records still surviving in Egypt. He developed the so-called Chicago House method, where drawings on photographic enlargement, uh, very important scholars, among which Faulkner, the writer of one of the first dictionary, and Gardiner, the writer of the first Middle Egyptian grammar, went to Egypt to document. Still nowadays, uh, you uh, make photo enlargement, you draw on, on, uh, on the photo to document everything you see. You, you see uh, artists, Margaret de Jong, myself, uh, Christian Bertus documenting what is actually perishing and documenting, as Bresta says, as accurate as humanly possible. So in order to correct every single mistake, in order to render, here is Director Ray Johnson making, making a so-called director check to document these thousands of fragments still in line there, which, mind you, have not been documented. But the urgency that Breasted had almost uh, uh, 100 years ago is now becoming more urgent because of the change of uh, um, due to the Aswan the high dam of the Nasser Lake and what water management means. Nobody prevent, uh, could foresee at that time that the Nasser Lake would change the microclimate. It's much more humid in Luxor and Aswan, it's raining much more, and there is intensive agriculture. There are, uh, the monuments were used to be inundated once a year and then to be very dry. Now, especially with the cultivation of sugar cane, uh, they're all flooded. And then what does happen? The temples are made of sandstone. Uh, they become wet. Then uh, with a, a, a high temperature in the sun, the salt migrates on the surface and ritually the temples are crumbling. The reliefs are exploding and temples are coming down. Until recently, archaeological work in Egypt involved the systematic recovery uh, and documentation of the preserved remains from antiquity in order to make the data accessible to scholar and layperson alike. Today's Egyptian archaeological community, however, finds itself forced to adjust to surprising changes in environmental and demographic condition. The Lake Nasser creates tremendous amount of airborne moisture through evaporation and condensation. Humidity fluctuations in the air, impossible even 20 years ago, are now a daily occurrence. They activate groundwater soils trapped in the temple walls, which migrate to the surface, crystallize, and shatter the stone. Runoff water from over irrigated fields result in abnormally long periods of high groundwater, which contain dissolved salts that eat away the foundation of stone monuments and destabilize them. So, well, you know, these wonderful pictures that we see of our cultural life in Egypt, but the sugar cane, which is intensively uh, cultivated and exploited, is really creating problems. And I, I 
finishing because I see that my time, I still have two minutes. Uh, we see really inside the temple how things are, um, how they are affected. There is a deep watering project going around the major temple to try to buy off time. It's not the solution. What we're doing is pumping water from the temple so that the water level, the water table goes down and temples are not so affected. Um, what has been doing was uh, in, in, in the groundwater is bo uh, both on the east and west bank. Uh, and um, what he's been doing to try to prevent all of this is first of all, documenting how the temples are moving, uh, building trenches around the temple, which was a major archeological endeavor. Uh, because this was the situation in 2009 in front of the pattern of the Temple of Karnak. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, you see, it was uh, both an archaeological endeavor because we had to uh, build trenches and work very quickly in rescue excavation in one of the most sensitive area worldwide uh, concerning Egyptian remains, uh, putting pumps to pumps of water and analyzing also what kind of water was there, what kind of salt. In the meantime, the Ministry of Antiquity and Tourism is taking enormous effort on conserving uh, uh, the reliefs and creating labs where uh, reliefs can be put on and also constant observation of how the temple might be affected. Look at this, this is really heartbreaking for an archeologist to see how the salt is dissolving the, these monuments, which are uh, uh, mankind. So you see um, how people are uh, trying to intervene, are trying to intervene in the columns. You see how wet it gets. And you can imagine how the pigments and everything, the, um, um, the motic graffiti in the temple completely disappearing. So this also meant that a lot of gates had to be um, conserve, restore, this is uh, in the terminus of Karnak. The foundation uh, had to be uh, restored because sometimes the sandstone on the very bottom, which is part of the foundation of the gate, is just in this condition. So there is an army of our colleagues, uh, conservators working there from uh, the Ministry of uh, Antiquities and Tourism, really trying to fight against time. And sometimes when you realize that there is uh, uh, the, the sandstone of a floor are affected, like here in the Honsu temple, when you go down and because you remove the upper stone and you discover down a temple which we didn't even know existed, which is the temple of Tutmosis III built before the temple of Ramses III. And these are rescue drawing, trying to document and save. Uh, because a lot of painting, this was the temple of Honsu in 2009, had to be completely opened up because of the water. This opening up allowed anyway the discovery of a previous temple. The blocks could not be taken out, but have been very documented and the temple has been repaved. And this repaving is going on in Luxor, in Karnak, uh, putting also sand uh, uh, and a kind of filter to prevent water to go up to try to save what we can save. As I said, this is not the solution. This is only buying time. And uh, well, I know uh, that uh, uh, water is a major element, as we have briefly seen in ancient Egyptian religion, ancient Egyptian civilization. One part that is sometimes discarded and which is vital also in archaeology of Sudan and Ethiopia are the monuments. And I just wanted to voice that out. Uh, monuments are part of our collective memory and the change of water, the creation of high dam, people do not realize what the, the change of microclimate can, how could affect also these monuments. Thank you and sorry for taking a little bit more time. No, thank you so much for this um, amazing presentation, um, which also gave the archaeological perspective, of course. And if I just may add one short um, yeah, observation which came to mind, of the two different parts of your presentation, whereas in the first we saw how some how, how human beings in ancient times saw themselves as part of nature. And in the second part, we saw how human beings with their domination of nature.
nature actually impact not only nature but our own cultural heritage and i thought that was um quite striking and i'm sure there will be actually a lot of questions also to you but if you agree we would postpone them to after the panel so also to the reactions to the panel if that is okay yes, yes? Okay. okay good well i will then hand over now to Francesca Caruso, my colleague and researcher within the YAIS Mediterranean Middle East and Africa program, and she's also a consultant for the peace program of the community of Sant'Ecidio. And um, as I said before, um, this project has been conceived of by, by Francesca, um, that the project in the framework of which this webinar is taking place. So um, Francesca, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Daniela. Thank you very much to all the participants to the, this uh, wonderful keynote speech, and also to the Compagnia di San Paolo and University of um, Turin. So um, I am Francesca Caruso. And um, before starting our panel, I would like um, to stress the fact that uh, the GERD crisis is not only interesting um, because of its um, historical uh, importance in Egypt. But it's also interesting because in addition to explaining the national interest of the country is involved, it is an excellent lens for analyzing crop casting, cutting issues affecting many countries and conflict. For instance, regional dynamics in the Horn of Africa, new relations between North African countries and Sub-Saharan countries, the capacity of multilateral institutions to solve crises, and in particular of regional African institutions, especially in that moment where we have witnessed a lot of coup and that uh, regional uh, African institutions were not capable to respond. But then it is also interest uh, to see if the international water law is capable to address this kind of dispute. And also, and I say, uh, I say it now here from Bangui, where, where there is a lively uh, national, Repu national Republican dialogue, it is also interesting because the GERD uh, crisis address the fact that sovereign states and in particular African states are questioning if they have to agree or not with agreements that were signed during colonial times. So uh, as Daniela uh, Huber uh, has said uh, during the introduction, this webinar is organized within the framework of the research project African Challenges to Multilateralism, the geopolitic of the Nile between conflict and cooperation. And the aim of this project is to identify the possible solution attainable through multilateral mediation in the Horn of Africa between Ethiopia, Egypt, and Sudan. So uh, why, why? Because despite the several attempts at mediation by both regional and international organizations during this decade, no agreement on the functioning of the dam seems to be inside. Also today, a month after that the dam has started to work. Why? Because critical issues and local opposition in the three countries involved challenge the attempts made by the international community at promoting multilateral solution and also the establishment of common strategies for an inclusive management of the Nile's water resources is challenged by increasing geopolitical tensions. And this is happening in a region, the Horn of Africa, that has been already challenged by deep uh, conflict and crisis such as the Somalia instability, South Sudan um, civil war, uh, Sudan political transition, uh, and la uh, lastly, the Ethiopian uh, Tigray crisis. So in order to find possible solution, uh, our aim is to uh, answer the following question. First, how do national interests of the riparian states favor or oppose dynamics of conflicts and cooperation for the governance of the Nile and how have they developed over time? Two, what is at stake for the riparian states and what are their options for negotiations? Three, how do external actors such as countries from the Gulf regions, but also European countries, the United States, Turkey, China, influence this dynamic 
at a national level and last and lastly, what are the instruments and process available to regional organization, and in particular the African Union, to foster multilateral solution for the governance of the Nile? So today we will try to answer to this question with our distinguished guests uh, from uh, uh, Sudan, uh, Nigeria, and Washington. So and Lis and Lisbon. So uh, our distinguished guests are Jesuti Melehin Akamo, researcher of the Africa Peace and Security Program at the Institute for Peace and Security Studies of Addis Ababa. Akram Abbas from Sudan, researcher and consultant for the Italian Ag Agency for Development Cooperation. Miret Mabruk, director of the Egypt program at Middle East Institute, and Anna Elisa Cascao, independent consultant and researcher from Lisbona. So uh, I would like now to give uh, the floor to uh, Timi Akamo. Uh, so, Timi. On the 2nd April of 2011, Ethiopia announced the construction of the GERD after signing a 4.8 billion construction contract with the Italian firm Salini. At the official groundbreaking ceremony of the GERD, former Prime Minister Zenawi said, we have gathered here today at the largest of our river to witness the launch of this great project. It is rightly called the Millennium Dam. It is the largest dam we could build at any point along the Nile or indeed any other river. Timmy, what are the local dynamics and national interests that pushed Ethiopia to build the dam? And how did Ethiopia position itself in this decade of negotiation? Please, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Um, it's nice to see everyone here. It's nice to be able to talk to everyone. Um, my name is Jesu Timile Akamo. You can call me Timmy if my name is interestingly long for you. Um, um, I am a researcher at the African Peace and Security Program of the of IPSS at, in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And um, working on this project so far, I think, um, Francesca, you've presented a very good starting point, and that's from the speech of um, former Prime Minister Meli Zenawi. And the reason why I'm saying that is, um, I mean, some have described the guard as, as, as his brainchild. And the, the points from his speech highlight key things that um, in the course of the study so far, I found consistent, even though methods, even though the approach um, of um, Abiy Ahmed, for example, might be quite different, um, the, the objective, the national interest at hand um, remained consistent. And I will start with, with the fact that first is that um, at the mode of um, governance of Prime Minister Zenawi um, kind of led to um, drop in approval ratings as, as it seems. So for, for a project like the GERD, um, it, yeah, um, it was important for his approval rating to increase. And if you notice, um, this, if, you, if you go through his speech, um, the sense in which he spoke was in the sense of the collective. Um, he, uses, he used the we, the are, when he, when he was talking about the river, when he was talking about the good. And that, for me, points to the fact that there's a need to, um, um, to, to, to pay um, a very interesting attention to so how he framed um, the points that he laid down within that context. And one of the things that he laid down, which um, is um, interesting, is um, electrification development. Um, and um, for a very long time, I mean, Ethiopia has been able to produce some electricity, but not enough for the entire country. But the GERD seem, um, I mean, the GERD project was a bit ambitious doesn't want to come and um, cover the entire Ethiopia alone, but also wants to be able to export um, um, electricity to neighboring countries. And he also highlighted having to deal with developmental issues and poverty. And along the line, he also talked about in the speech, he also talked about agriculture and fisheries, something that um, Ethiopians have not been able to have access to in terms of the use of the Nile. And um, let's not also forget that the conflict with Eritrea um, gave Ethiopia little access to, to um, such um, 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 a mass of water. Um, to, I mean, that's towards the east. 
So the Nile seemed like the only major water body for Ethiopia at the time. So having such projects and pursuing um, an equitable um, access to the use of the Nile water seemed not just um, um, good for political or approval ratings, it was also it was also a regional move um, to to um, as we'll see further when, when I continue to discuss and to justify the the GERD um, um, at regional level, it highlighted um, some benefits for Sudan and Egypt, and that included the um, flooding Egypt and Sudan goes through um, experience rather um, flooding, and um, it talked about how silt and sediment affects the dams in Sudan and Egypt and how that the GERD will reduce um, how will reduce the impact of silt and sediments at the dam, and then um, the Nile also experiences um, um, wastage of water by evaporation. And so the GERD, um, the reservoirs were supposed to hold up a large mass of water, which he referred to as um, um, the um, a, a very large um, man-made um, lake. I mean, uh, from the description, it's larger than the Tana, and such, uh, I mean, the reduction in water, um, um, addressing the issue on reduction in water by evaporation. Um, and then it also highlighted something that would make me, uh, that, 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 that I, I think is important to note from his speech. He highlighted that the GERD was an opportunity for riparian states um, to, um, to enhance cooperation amongst each other. Now, whether they've been able to achieve that as of now or not, um, that's still under debate, but to a large extent, um, I, I, I do see, I do believe that, or let me say, evidence suggests that if this, uh, if the GERD crisis is handled properly, um, cooperation and coordination with um, countries in the Horn of Africa and North of Africa would actually improve. And so I'll move on to, to um, 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 national, um, I mean, national interest. Um, the first thing that, um, that's, points that, that 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 makes me that makes me wonder is how that the Entebbe agreement that was signed um made um especially in the article 14b kind of made it possible for the riparian states to securitize the Nile. And there was there were some there were debates around the the, the choice of words in Article 14B and that includes um either to use significantly significantly affect um, um, others or adversely affect, and using that word alone, use it significantly affect, which means I mean you measure the impact um, of the GERD based on, for example, now based on um, on how much it has affected um, the um, other countries, whether it is positive or negative. But use of the word adversely points to something negative. So. Ethiopia maintains that they have to leave it as significantly, while um, Egypt um, would um, would have preferred um, 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 the use of adversely in order to to perhaps a preventive measure. Now, one thing about the um, about the differences between um, Meli Zenawi's approach and Abi Ami's approach um, as of now is that Meli Zenawi was more and um, took more of the hardline approach. While Abi Ahmed was more pacific in his approach and more understanding to the concerns of other riparian states. And um, Abi Ahmed's pacific um, approach can also be seen even beyond the GERD, um, address, um, in terms of solving the crisis with Eritrea um, and I mean, trying to improve Egypt. And so you see that, um, you also see in the appointment of, um, of officials, um, Abi Ahmed um, first, um, um, forcefully retired the intelligence chief. And then the armed forces chief, um, Asifa and Yunus, which for me demonstrates the fact that he wants, he, he intends to move away from the from the hardline approach to to diplomacy when it comes when it's when we are when we are when um, when it comes to the gut talks rather than um, the previous um, ones that had led to many um, deadlocks. So um, prospectively, I would say that under Abiy Ahmed, um, the negotiations do have um, quite a number of prospects. Then um, one thing about the, um, the, 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 the local dynamics, which I should have mentioned earlier, is um, also drawing from Melizanawi's speech, 
on the on the on the use of we and our use of the collective in describing the Nile and the dirt mm -hmm. is that before the Entebbe agreement was signed, there was this um, there was there, there is a belief that um, Ethiopia was excluded um, from the the previous agreement, the 1902 agreement, the 1929 agreement, and the 1959 agreement, which also Ethiopia had a problem with because they were signed within the colonial context, and so. Um, for 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 Ethiopia, the um, permit me to use the word hydro hegemony that um, that Egypt um, um, enjoyed over the Nile, or not Egypt now the up the up, the downstream states. Um, Ethiopia believed it to be unjust and um, and unequitable in terms of the water distribution, the water sharing, and, and how it should go. And so, the the Entebbe Agreement kind of presented a new permit me to say a new order when it comes to the Nile, which is which will lead me to my concluding point, which is about the position of Ethiopia. Based on um, their, their position on what happened before the Entebbe agreement uh, about the water sharing and um, and how it goes and the what, what is happening after the Entebbe agreement, you'd see that Ethiopia is, um, although Abiy Ahmed is more pacific about it, Ethiopia is less likely to agree if um, whatever technical proposal or water sharing formula is presented, if it in any sense um, follows through from the agreements before the before the TMB agreement was signed, and that is because Ethiopia 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 believes and insists that um, the downstream states cannot um, have so much access. To that amount of water when the water comes from the upstream states, and the best the, one of the recommendations that um, I, I I was able to um, to map out um, is first is there's a need to build trust between uh, between um, between especially Ethiopia, Egypt, and Sudan um, because the 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 crisis within Ethiopia also there are anecdotal anecdotal evidences of foreign interference, and so there's a need to build trust. In order for the negotiations negotiations to go better go, to go on better, and lastly, there's a need for all the countries to be ready to make strategic concessions. I know I won't be able to cover everything in one sitting, but I, I think that's okay for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Timmy. There will be maybe some time also for the Q and A, so that you can go more in depth with some um, issues. So, uh, as you said uh, during the uh, launch of the GERD, uh, Zene, we said that the GERD could be an opportunity for riparian states to collaborate and also that it could eradicate poverty, not only for Ethiopia, but also for uh, all other uh, neighboring countries and also Sudan, uh, which was not the case. We did not see a collaboration with the, between the three countries in the last decade. And uh, um, especially now, I would like to focus on Sudan. Why? Because uh, uh, we know, as you were saying before, that until uh, 2011, the let's say the utilization of the Nile was regulated by two um, agreements that were signed during colonial times, one of 1929 between uh, same independent Egypt and the British government and the other one uh, in 1959 between Egypt and uh, Sudan, giving the two countries water rights on the river. Uh, however, in the last decade, we have seen that Sudan had a mutual position over the GERD because it has moved from a neutral position, then he went back to Ethiopia and then um, uh, become closer to Egypt. So uh, Akram Abbas from Sudan, now I would like to give the floor to you. Uh, so uh, what are the opportunities and challenges for uh, Sudan? Thank you, Francesca. And thank you for over everybody around uh, the table that for attending this very important platform, I think. So uh, my name is Akram Abbas. Um, uh, as my colleague Francesca, I am a researcher and uh, associate lecturer in the development study and also as well working as a technical advisor for the Italian cooperation office in Sudan. So <clears throat> I think I will, in, I will start my intervention by just stating that I think Sudan historically is paying a lot of uh, things regarding to his uh, location. It's, 
geographical location. So I think this is, we are paying P4 and we still are paying this because of, I think, the location of Sudan also influence sometimes the, the local position of Sudan towards many issues. Sometimes it is internal issues and also the issues related to the, to the regional dilemma. So I think if we check the, the historical point of the development of the issue of the dam and try to connect them with the, <clears throat> with the historical moment uh, in Sudan, this is, will make like a clear, uh, clear picture of the causes of the, the, as I titled it in my research paper, the subjective position of Sudan towards the dam. And uh, I think historically the relation between Sudan and Ethiopia and Egypt also, also it's something constituted by this historical moment. So for example, I think when just check back the, the historical moment of the, the agreements, the recent agreement around the Nile, because you know all of you that the, the agreement around the, the issue of the Nile also historically developed in a many historical moments. It started from 1902 until 1929. Uh, and I think the recent one is 1959, which is this is historically in the interpretation of the Sudanese. This is the first time that Sudan, after the independence of Sudan, which is in 1956, is Sudan to have like a military coup, which is, is so close to this, to, this, uh, to this historical moment because before the, the before the this military coup in 1958, it's Sudan was involved in the discussion of the, the, the issue of this kind of agreement allow the new quota of increase the new quota of Egypt and also the building of the, the dam, the, the, the upgrade of the dam of Aswan, which is I think this coup, even in the interpretation of the political history in Sudan, is well connected the issue of the the coup and also the, the instability in Sudan with this with signing this agreement, which is which is this agreement also technically and also politically affect the position internally in Sudan because also we lost some of our lands in the upper north of Sudan and also make a, a new uh, wave of migration, internal migration to Sudan. And also we lost like a huge agriculture uh, lands in, in Northern Sudan, which is even in the, in, the, in the local interpretation of the Sudanese, whether the political expert or even the, the politician or the Sudanese, they, until now they could see the, the agreement of 1959, Sudan is a big loser of this agreement. So if we, if we, trace, we trace also, Going to the to the history also, we look to the, the development of the idea of the dam when it started to be like an idea and physical idea. I think this is started in when the when the Asubia announced, and I, I think specifically the cabinet of the ministries in Asubia specifically announced that the the that they are two options of managing the Nile, whether to have this kind of individual management and also to keep the interest of the every state or to have this kind of cooperation. This moment also historically connected with the, 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 the development of the last wave of the civil war between Sudan and South Sudan, which is also this is kind of war influenced by the regional countries. So when Sudan take the position towards this announcement of the Asubia and be its position like more subjective to agree on the, the approach of building the dam and also increase the interest of the Asubian from benefiting from this dam. I think also this is something that we should connect it with the, the, the historical time. And this is, uh, was in 2002, which is the start of the negotiation of between South Sudan and Northern Sudan, which is, I think also this negotiation also supported by the regional countries, specifically Asubian and has a lot of influence on the Sudan government and the SPLA to have this kind of agreement. And also if we connect also historically, when they, they, uh, the uh, Ethiopia inaugurate the dam, and this is speech that my colleague mentioned it in his uh, intervention the, of Millis in 2011, I think this is the moment of the secession of the South Sudan on the hand, and on the other hand, the case of al-Bashir, the head of the, the previous regime in Sudan in the ICC. And I think this is something also we should emphasize a little bit on it because the support of Ethiopia and the part of the, the African Union countries to the case of Al-Bashir 
in the ICC. This is something also make the, the position of Sudan a little bit subjective and have this kind of bargaining, taking a political interest in the hand and the other hand also looking for increasing the support of the African countries towards the regime also ruling the, 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 the Sudan. So <clears throat> what I want to just focus on it, it's just because of this kind of political bargaining that Sudan usually is used it. And I think this is also is for sure historically after the independence, we, got, we had this kind of political bargaining, but this is also increased up during the 30, 30 years of the Islamic regime ruling the Sudan. Because the same case also with Egypt, because until now we have this kind of conflict with Egypt and all of the people that know that the, the problem of Sudan and uh, Egypt around the Triangle of Halai, which is this issue, it's, it's like an issue of a borders between Sudan and Egypt. And also this is kind of a causes of conflict sometimes between Sudan and Egypt and causes of also cooperation between Sudan and Egypt because Egypt usually using this kind of issues just to bargain and also to have a full support of Sudan in the dam. This is, leads me to the, to the causes of the, the problem of Sudan. First of all, as I mentioned to you, the location and the bargaining, the political bargaining and an issue of Sudan. On the top of them, for sure, the internal conflict in Sudan, which is are ongoing until now. So because of our location, that many interfer interfer interference that also influence the, the position of the, 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 the army groups in Sudan and the rebels, and also the issue of the, the making the logistics to this kind of internal conflict in Sudan. And also the, the borders itself. And, but this is, it leads me to the other part of the technical part, because here I, 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 um, I will quote the, one of the, because I, I used to interview the people that involve in the negotiation process, specifically the technical expert of the Sudanese technical expert. So the problem over this technically that all of the, from the started the position of Sudan towards the dam and even this turning over point, the, the agreement signed between Sudan and Ethiopia and Egypt in 2015, that Sudan is not relying its political position on a technical consultation. And this is, I caught uh, the, the expert working closely to the negotiation team of Sudan. There is this connection between the technical, technical position of the Sudan and the political position, which is, is until now is carrying on. The political position based on the other issue like the bargaining, the maintain of the relation over other things. And also this is, I think they, this is create two schools in Sudan politically and technically, and this is if I can answer to the local, local, local perspective in Sudan, two, two schools. One of them that uh, could see that the, the dam, if we start this kind of bilateral with Ethiopia, the Sudan will benefit more from this issue of dam. And this is school also going to have this kind of a neutral position or objective position of Sudan, and not just following the, the Egyptian position. And the other school also could see, you know, it's, it's kind of maintaining the relation with Egypt and also have this kind of a pressure position with Egypt towards the, the dam. For me, that if I can, I, I, I could say as a conclusion that I could see that the, the old position of Sudan, despite the, what I, I mentioned as a causes of the position of Sudan towards the dam, I think there are three factors that usually will influence the position of Sudan. This is what I call it in my research paper, the water marketplace. I think the agricultural sector, because we have a joint agricultural sector, huge agricultural sector with Ethiopia. And until now that all of the seasonal workers that working in the, our agricultural sector, they are coming from Ethiopia. So this is its, its things. The other is also the migrant focus, because it's, until now, we don't have this kind of physical borders between us and Ethiopia and Eritrea. So, and we have a joint rivals. So this is also another dilemma because right now after this problem of Tigray in Ethiopia, that Sudan, Sudan received a lot of uh, migrants from Ethiopia. We have usually during the year, an influx of refugees coming through the, the, the borders to Sudan. And I think it's the, 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 the last point is that the regional conflict over 
the political gain in Sudan during the transitional period and also for the future of the democratic transformation in Sudan. So I think the position of Sudan usually will be influenced by these three factors, what I call it the water marketplace. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Akram. Um, among the different arguments you mentioned, you mentioned 2011, of course, but that it was also significant for Egypt, because as we all know, uh, in Egypt, there was uh, the revolution. And uh, uh, we also have to see if uh, the fact that uh, in Egypt, there was a revolution, so a changing of regime had an impact to push Ethiopia to announce uh, the construction of the dam. Uh, so now I would like uh, to focus on Egypt with uh, Mirette Mabrouk, um, um, director of Egypt program from the Middle East Institute. Um, Mirette, as it has already been discussed broadly, the Nile, it has always been considered vital for uh, Egypt. Um, and also in most recent times, for example, in 1978, Sadat warned that we depend upon the Nile 100% in our lives. So if anyone at any moment thinks to deprive us on our life, we shall never hesitate because it is a matter of life and death. Uh, however, it seems that in the last decade, uh, Egypt failed uh, to dominate the negotiations over the GERD and, then sp and especially to have any consistent influence uh, over Ethiopia. Uh, is this correct, uh, Mirette? And um, where did Egypt go wrong in managing the GERD dispute, if it's correct? Thank you. Oh. Thank you so much, Francesca, and thank you to Jessica Tumilin and Akram. I'm going to just back up um, um, a little bit. Um, where did Egypt go wrong? Um, I think, yeah, I think we'll have to back up a little bit. I think the first, one of the first things that you'd mentioned was that um, a lot of countries did not want to be uh, hampered by formerly colonial agreements. And the answer to that is they're not. OK, in the GERD negotiations, the only agreement on the table between uh, uh, Egypt, Ethiopia and Sudan is the 2015 Declaration of Independence that was signed by all three of their presidents. Now, the other um, uh, the other agreements that you've mentioned, the 1952 agreement, which gave 55 billion uh, to uh, 55 billion cubic meters to Egypt and 18 billion to uh, Sudan and did not take in uh, and I mean, did not consider the riparian country it, rights of other countries. Um, you want to bear in mind that um, that's pretty much off the table at the moment. It has been for a long time, as the, was the 1929 agreement, um, which was signed with five other countries that did. And there's no veto, by the way. A veto is a constitutionally mandated right of refusal. Uh, five other countries that said that they you know, wouldn't build uh, dams without consultation. Ethiopia is not one of them. So I don't know why anyone thinks that Ethiopia would be held by a treaty that it did not sign on to and does not recognize. So, you know, it's no point in that. And then the 1902 agreement. Um, now, Ethiopia did concede not to build a dam, but you want to bear in mind that it was a quid pro quo. In return for that, Ethiopia got the Benishangul Gumuz area, sovereignty of which devolved from Khartoum to Addis Ababa. And, and one of the importances of that is. Um, that's where the, the dam is, that's the site of the dam. And that was why uh, I think about a year ago, the, the um, Sudan you know, told uh, Ethiopia, well, I mean, if you don't want to agree to an international, if you don't want to abide by international agreements, then fine, but you know, keep your dam, but give us back the Benishen Bulgumuz area. And of course, Ethiopia said that was ridiculous because yes, 120 years later, you know, that's beside the point. So the only agreement on the table is the 2015 one, which, um, which was signed and which Egypt and Sudan now say that Ethiopia is not sticking to and Ethiopia says it is. To cut an extremely long story short, the issue with this dam is as follows. Under normal circumstances, there should not be a problem with this dam. 
All right. There are advantages to it, as as Timmy said, there are advantages to it, especially in the case of Sudan, which really gets it in the neck with flooding. OK, um, cheaper electricity, silt. Uh, there are there are advantages of it. The problem comes with what happens if there's a drought. OK, now um, Egypt is uh, the the most downstream country of the Nile. All right. So even when when people say, well, uh, and I actually think that the older agreements that did not take into account riparian rights of other countries were, you know, a huge problem, diplomatically speaking, but practically speaking, uh, downstream countries don't take water from someone else. It's not like Egypt and Sudan are sucking out water from someone else. It doesn't work that way. I mean, rivers are, go like this. And uh, by the time the water gets to Sudan and Egypt, it's gone through all the other countries. So um, they, diplomatically speaking, I think those were uh, problems. But sorry, as I was saying, the problem comes is uh, uh, the problem comes if there is a, a drought. Okay, um, Egypt does not exist without the Nile. Egypt is ninety-seven percent desert. Um, I, I, I mean, I was shocked to hear that Herodotus might not have been in Egypt. It's going to break my heart, but just in case. But he, whoever said that Egypt was the gift of the Nile is, is absolutely correct, which is why the entire, you know, you'll find that most of the population of 104 million or whatever it is now, sli you know, lives along that, you know, slight fertile strip down the middle and along the coastal cities. So the question with the dam is, what happens if there is a drought? Now, it's especially relevant because no one has any idea what the uh, uh, what the um, what the results uh, you know whether adverse or not are going to be on the downstream countries because this is the only dam in the world of its size that was built without an ESIA. ESIA is an Environmental Sustainability and Impact Assessment, which checks what's going to happen to the downstream countries. There isn't one for this dam. Okay, so we have no idea. However, if there is a drought, okay, Ethiopia is going to need, still going to need the water to turn those turbines. This is a hydroelectric power dam. So then the question becomes how much water is released to the downstream countries at that time. Now, again, um, no one really knows, but, but the issue of course is this is, as we said, this is a hydroelectric dam. And what, I mean, Timmy had said that um, countries need to make concessions. And I think Egypt started in a position where it thought that it would be, I, I think, able to exert more influence. But it has become very, very clear over the last you know, 12 years that this is just not going to happen. And Ethiopia has not made concessions because it doesn't feel it, it needs to. It's really that simple. All right. Sudan and, and Egypt do not have the leverage on Ethiopia that they need to to get it to exact any significant uh, uh, any significant concessions. And the whole argument has been on um, extracting a, a legally uh, um, a legally binding agreement on the filling and operating of the dam, i.e. what happens if there is a drought. Now, because it's a hydroelectric power dam, I think it, it eventually in, on the concessions part, eventually Egypt said, well, fine, uh, we'll do it this way. Uh, if you have, uh, if we have a drought, how about uh, you as an Ethiopia run the dam at 80% and then you have 80% and, uh, you know, the 20% uh, that you lose supports the two downstream countries and Ethiopia refused, at which point Egypt said, fine, no problem. Um, if you run the, the, the turbines at 80%, then any losses Ethiopia incurs will be covered by Egypt whether in electricity or cash, but we will cover the, the losses. And Ethiopia refused. So then the question is, well, is, oh, is it still about electricity? And I, I don't think that, I mean, there is a full realization, I think in Egypt, of the importance of this dam to Ethiopia. And there is a full realization in Egypt that I think the time when Egypt thought that it would call all the shots on the Nile are, are done. But at the moment, uh, um, Egypt is massively worried about what happens with uh, a drought. And I think that is complicated by the fact that there is a history 
Okay. Um, I mean, there's a history with uh, Ethiopian dams and its its neighboring countries in Kenya, where um, the the Lake Tarkana, uh, uh, Lake Tarkana Lake, which is a UNESCO heritage site, is actually uh, drying up. And that, as far back as 2018, environmentalists had warned the 300,000 Kenyans who depended on the lake would uh, you know be inversely would be adversely affected by uh, the uh, Gebe two and three dams and that's exactly what, ha what what's happened okay so the the whole point of, of this really is that um, th there's also yeah sorry the one more thing is when we talk about the amount of water um, the amount of water that you're talking about here is the, the 55 billion uh, cubic meters that Egypt used to take. Um, Egypt uses about 112 billion cubic meters, and it does that by recycling. It recycles more than any other country in the MENA region. But for comparison, I think Egyptians you know, will say, well, bear in mind that Ethiopia, for example, gets 936 billion cubic meters of water a year in rainfall. I mean, Ethiopian cattle consume more water than Egypt and Sudan combined, but it isn't even that. It's a matter of agreeing on. Uh, it's a matter of agreeing on uh, uh, an, a, a legally binding agreement for what happens if things go wrong, and I think that's that's the um, that's the huge problem. And you want to bear in mind that. If there is a drought, the last time there was a large drought was in 19, between 84, uh, between 84 and 89, I think in the mid 80s, where um, Egypt was more or less saved by the Aswan Dam, but there were about 43 million Egyptians at, at the time. Um, there are now about 104 million, and the Aswan Dam might carry Egypt for a year, but then after that, 96% of all of Egypt's drinking and agrarian water comes from the dam. So it, it really is a, um, a nightmare coming down the, down the road for, for Egypt. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Miret, uh, especially because saying this, you remember us also the fact that usually we have the feeling that this crisis is addressed from a state perspective, but never from a human um, perspective. We never, we ne we, we, it's difficult to understand what the Egyptian population is thinking, what the Ethiopian population and, is thinking, and Sudan. So uh, I think that this is something which will, uh, should be also uh, addressed. Uh, so now uh, I would like to give the floor to our um, speaker, Anna Cascao. Uh, from Lisbon, Anna, she is an independent researcher that has been studying um, for many years the um, uh, hydro politics uh, over the Nile. So uh, Anna uh, will discuss the regional and global dimension of the GERD. Anna, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. First of all, thanks for the invitation to be part of this uh, great event. Uh, Francesca, perhaps I would just like you to share the slides. Uh, they are short and I'm not going to take a lot of time in the details, but I think it would be good to, to have it as, as image, uh, I mean, for a timeline. Uh, thank you very much for the previous presentation because I think it really uh, shows how complicated the issue is. I mean, it's related to the to the to the international or foreign policies of these uh, three countries involved in the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance that goes beyond that. And uh, I think uh, Akram mentioned in the case of Sudan, the major changes in the past uh, 70 years since the independence, how this shows that uh, Sudan itself, for example, is very much influenced by geopolitics. In any case, my, my presentation is not about the relations between these three countries, because there is three representatives from them, and I'm not from any of the countries. And I would like to look at it in particular for the past uh, years, but let, let's go back until 2011, to understand how the global and regional geopolitics changes uh, which we are observing, uh, and they are rapid changes, uh, influence or have been influenced the uh, GERD negotiations. I'm not talking about technical issues. I'm basically talking about uh, political issues. Uh, so if I can go to my second slide. Um, part of what we have been hearing and saying that there is no, there has been no cooperation between these three countries regarding the GERD, 
I think that's not accurate. I mean, these countries have been meeting in a year basis, in a monthly basis, in a weekly basis for the past 10 years in order to find a solution. So the countries, the three of them, cannot be accused of not trying because they have uh, for uh, several years uh, tried to address the issue first in technical levels and then diplomatic levels and even involving at a certain point in time. Uh, as you mentioned, the heads of states when they signed the two, 2015 uh, Declaration of Principles and even the heads of intelligence have been present in some meetings. This shows how important the issue is and shows how this goes well beyond the water resources. Of course, that for Egypt, this is a major concern in terms of, let's say, actual consumption now and how could it impact, but it's more than that. I mean, uh, the Nile is just one of the geopolitical issues of uh, Egypt that, as we know, is a very important country in the global geopolitics. But if I would just uh, try to uh, outline who has been involved in the third process from the outside in order to try to find a solution, which is not necessarily the outcome because we don't have agreement yet. And if we don't have agreement is because the achievement, uh, I mean, the goals were not achieved to have an agreement, regardless of what we call it, if it's permanent, if it's uh, just for the feeling, if it's just for the long-term operations, the fact is that there is no agreement and there were already two feelings of the done. And in 2011, when the project was announced, and I think this is important to, to highlight, and uh, in particular looking at the role of Sudan, is that yes, this was a unilateral project announced by Prime Minister Meles and Abiy at the time, but this came after an agreement, which was not, uh, of course, in the public domain with the president of Sudan at the time, uh, President Omar Bashi. I mean, this didn't happen like one day, waste up and the prime minister launched a project of these dimensions and of these costs. For five years, I mean, the countries have been collaborating. I mean, the dam was announced in April and already in June, the three countries were sitting together trying to address, and uh, Mirette has mentioned, the, the impacts, to understand the impacts of the dam in environmental terms, but uh, in particular in the water releases. And Sudan had a particular role between uh, 2000, let's say 14 and 15 and 16 in bringing the countries together. I mean, it was not the mediator because Sudan has its own interests, of course, but was able somehow to make the DOP, uh, the Declaration of Principles possible, and it was signed in Khartoum. In any case, once again, there was not a solution, as, as you might know, and this was men mentioned by Ju uh, Jesus Timurlin, sorry for not pronouncing the name correctly, is that there was a change of the government in, in Ethiopia with the new prime minister Abiy Ahmed that, as you said, at a more, you use the word pacific, I would say, a soft approach to the third issue, visit uh, Egypt and has agreed uh, later on at the end of 2009 for a mediation process. And this is something that was unthinkable before October 2019 with the involvement of the United States and the World Bank in the process of external mediation. Uh, this has lasted for a few months. I'm talking about the process that was very high level, including the President Trump involvement in the negotiations. Once again, we were at the highest level possible and there were no solution. I could talk a bit about the, the other, the other uh, developments in the last two years. Uh, the hearings in the UN Security Council that didn't produce anything except saying that it should be a, 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 a process guided by the African Union. I mean, at the lowest level possible, it was again with support of the US and the EU. But meanwhile, uh, while we are looking at what is visible and public is in the media and everywhere, is that uh, there were other uh, attempts uh, by particular uh, some African countries, the latest one is Algeria, for example, but there were Senegal and South Africa through the African Union or bilaterally trying to play a role of facilitation or, or mediation, but the Gulf countries themselves. And this, this takes me to the second part or the next slide of my presentation that is very important to understand the GERD as part of uh, the dynamics of the Red Sea. I mean, the Red Sea is a body of uh, uh, salt water and not of, uh, uh, Francesca, can you move to the other slide, please? Uh, but it's very important in global trade. I mean, we have seen what happened when the Evergreen uh, boat got stuck in the Suez Canal. 
I mean, you can see the map here of the of the Horn of Africa, or sorry, the part of the Horn of Africa that is of interest for this conversation, plus the Arabian Peninsula and all the countries that are part of it. I mean, Egypt was particularly affected by this evergreen uh, incident, let's call it. But this opened up in terms of analysis to understand what is going on. Uh, here in the two sides of the Red Sea and how the countries, in particular the Emirates and Saudi Arabia have been offering good service, I mean, uh, uh, good office for these countries because they are main investors in all these three countries. I'm talking about Ethiopia, I'm talking about Sudan, and I'm talking about Egypt. And in particular in agriculture in Sudan, which is the major concern of Egypt, is not the GERD, but the agricultural development in Sudan that may be possible through the GERD. So Sudan has a lot of benefit, not just in flood control, but others. In any case, what we see here, uh, and this brings me back to the process of- One more minute, Anna, I sorry. I will try to, to finish up, is that this is very much connected with the new Middle East peace process. And by this I'm saying, at the same time the GERD was being negotiated in Washington, a new peace deal for the Middle East was being negotiated. And it was very important that Egypt would be part of it and endorse it. We know there is already an agreement, peace agreement with Israel in 1978 when Sadat has mentioned it. So it's totally connected. And let's not forget that out of this new Middle East process, Sudan has recognized the state of Israel, which have never done since 1956. And at the same time, package of economic support of the debt relief were being negotiated between the United States and the new governments of Sudan and Ethiopia. And that's why it became more soft. It's because they were normalizing and become under the spheres of influence of a lot of actors in the Middle East. And we should include Turkey as well, which is not a Red Sea, but is one of the main investors in this country, and now the world of Israel. Just two days ago, uh, uh, President Sisi was sitting with the uh, uh, Emir of uh, Emirates and the Prime Minister of, of Israel. So we could perhaps see Israel being one of the possible uh, mediators or facilitators in this game. This looks like far-fetched, but perhaps now that everything has been tried, the UN Security Council, the US, the EU, we cannot imagine Russia and China being part of a mediation process because they are pure upstream countries. Well, same applies for Turkey. And we cannot see that Turkey and China would even want to get involved into these issues because these are minor issues in the geopolitics. But I will not have time to talk here, for example, about foreign investment or the importance of the ports, because this would take me to the role of Eritrea and the peace of Ethiopia with Eritrea that is very much related to the GERD before, during and after. Uh, but I would like to say again, without details, that the GERD is now, since a few years, engulfed by the Red Sea geopolitics and ge geoeconomics. And this is what is going to decide if there is a solution or not for the GERD. Because uh, as Mirette said, and well, I mean, technically speaking, there is no problem. This could easily be found out a solution. The question is that how do you translate this into a legal agreement for the protection of all? I mean, that guarantees, gives guarantees to Egypt during drought periods, but gives guarantees to Ethiopia as well in the drought periods because Ethiopia doesn't have to carry the burden of the drought alone. I mean, so this is a common resource and this is a common solution. So perhaps the problem is in the geopolitics and geoeconomics and we can uh, 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 imagine that perhaps the solution if there is one available will come from there as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Anna. So um, thank you um, all. I think, unfortunately, we do uh, have really little time for a Q&A, but maybe I can collect one or two uh, questions. But if you want to make a question, please be very, very, very uh, short and go uh, directly to the point, please. Mulwalem uh, Lemma. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the chance. Uh, even if I enjoyed lately, I, I took a very interested idea from those who present their own idea. Yeah, uh, Egyptian believes that Egypt is a gift of Nile, but we Ethiopians believe we born Nile. Just, but when we see from things in Ethiopian side, we believe that Nile should use for those three countries with equity distribution. But 
many of the Egyptian and the Sudans write their their past and their before agreements, past agreements. But my question here is that many Egyptians they use Nile as their political card in the Horn of Africa and in the East Africa. Why they use this thing? And why Egyptians do not think about to increase the content of Nile in, in, throughout those three countries? Thank you, Mulwala. Dezal, please. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, my name is Suggestion. Uh, uh, I agree on the Sudan's, uh, I mean, his name is, I think, Akram. I agree on oh, there are two schools. The first, as he perfectly mentioned, there are neut neutral position, which the, see the issue from the benefit side only. The, there are also the other side is, as uh, Anna mentioned, like there is a perspective that Egypt is a very important country in the global geopolitics. So uh, they try to uh, hammer Ethiopia to sign uh, the, the unfair agreement. The issue is like, it is a, there is, the Ethiopian position is very clear. If there is a, was, if Egyptian need a water share agreement, let's to the cooperative framework agreement. If, if they need own, uh, own, uh, Operation and the, uh, if the the need is on the dam, the Greater Ethiopian Resins Dam, it's only the filling and operation. So it's very simple. It's not water sharing agreement. It's rather, it's uh, I mean uh, on the dam how to operate and how to fill, and that is very easy. Like my question, uh, my suggestion is like see the project from the the the, the, the first perspective as Egyptian I mean Sudanese people see like it from look the the project from neutral position like it is not i mean the, the political issue it's a technical issue like egyptians are for both for the egyptian presenters for me it is like a technical technical issue it's not political issue thank you thank you very much the last one ban bantayehu uh, Jezaheg, which I suppose is from uh, Ethiopia, please. Thank you very much. Uh, it was uh, really an interesting uh, discussion, uh, mostly from technical uh, point of view. Um, uh, yeah, but yeah, of course it's a, a huge issue, and it, it, it can't we can't cover all of the aspects of the divots in in this uh, short session. But um, uh, my view is that narrative is matter. And the, the narratives are different from different perspectives. And uh, for example, just, uh, yeah, from, from the Ethiopian side, for example, as you may have seen in the comments, uh, the belief, there is a belief that, you know, GERD should not be even tabled for negotiation. It's a, a water development project. And even uh, it has been um, uh, the agenda of the Security Council, uh, unusually, and, uh, maybe if it were a different country, other than Ethiopia, uh, building such a dam, that wouldn't have been the case. Uh, but in any way, uh, uh, this, this, these perspectives are um, important in the in the negotiations um, uh, as a whole, and also the positioning of the um, uh, country trying to mediate. For example, the position of the U.S. Uh, obviously, uh, for example, the pres President Trump commenting that um, uh, he has advised the Egyptians to bomb the, the dam if there is no agreement. So, you know, there are issues here and there, and uh, the, uh, that affects how genuinely uh, parties either negotiating or trying to mediate are, uh, um, you know, uh, helping or otherwise of uh, the, uh, the whatever uh, the negotiations, but uh, just to ask a specific question. Uh, anyway, that that's to compliment, but uh, a specific question uh, for Madame Mabrook is uh, because she was saying that uh, um, there was an environmental impact assessment uh, for the dam. I was wondering her, about her view on the report by the International Panel of Experts. 
uh, that was composed of experts from the three countries as well as from other countries uh, okay. in, in Europe. So specifically Perfect. on this, because this is part of the narrative and that's, that's very important. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So I, I give the Miret Right, I'll I'll try and do this very very quickly. Thank you to to everybody for their questions. If and please forgive me if I I run through them without giving them their their due um, their due weight. One, um, there are actually eleven countries in the Nile Basin. It's it's not three. Um, it's it's easy to think there are only three because there are three fighting over this at the moment. Um, but there are eleven countries in the Nile Basin, and I think the the idea is. Um, rivers are um, there are uh, there are transboundary um, uh, shared resource, and therefore you are absolutely right. We all of the countries involved uh, uh, do need to to cooperate. Uh, secondly, I think there was a question on the GERD uh, uh, should not be part of the negotiations. It sh uh, should not be part of Nile negotiations. Um, that's an argument that I've heard. I, I'm afraid I don't really understand it because the the GERD is a a dam and it's the largest uh, dam of its kind in Africa that happens to be on the Nile and it uses the Nile. So I I I I don't understand the the um, GERD should not be part of Nile. Uh, 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 Nile agreements uh, argument. I'm, I, perhaps someone could explain it to me at some point, but I'm afraid I don't understand it. And the last question about the inter uh, the the SEA and the International Panel uh, of Experts uh, um, agreement. Yes, that was in, you're absolutely right. That was in 2013, but um, that the IPOE doesn't contain an SEA. Um, there were actually, I think that if, if you read the agreement, there, there were issues that um, certain documents that the IPOE had requested um, never arrived. I think um, seven of them arrived incomplete. One of them didn't arrive at all. And therefore, the, uh, the, the, the sum up really of, of the agreement was we can't take a decision on this. It doesn't look particularly good. There are perhaps concerns with the safety. We have no idea of the, down, the impact on the downstream countries and more work needs to be done. Um, but, but then Ethiopia said, that's it. Thank you very much. We're not going to proceed more than that. So that's where the, um, the agreement lies. It's, it's publicly available it was in 2013. Everyone can read it. Thank you very much. Mirek, so I don't know if uh, uh, the other speakers would like to very, very br briefly say something. Yes, uh, Francesca, yes, I want to, to mention something because, yes, I want to carry in the points that mentioned by, uh, by Anna. I think, yeah, uh, for sure what, men what Anna mentioned, that uh, I do agree with the point that mentioned about the case of Sudan. But yes, I want to clarify two points that what I mentioned in my presentation that I try to, to connect the historical moment between between the, the 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 political development in Sudan and what has been done throughout this kind of development of the project itself. So for me, it's well connected these historical moments, despite despite the fact that I mentioned them shortly. But it's something that cannot be covered in this uh, short time. The other point that is the, just also to mention is that the current development in the political situation in Sudan also it will connect the issue of the dam. Because also now, I think in Sudan, during this dry time moment of the political situation in Sudan, even in the local opinion, I'm not talking about the official opinion, but in the local opinion, also there are some issues against the interference of, the, of Egypt, Emirates, and uh, the Gulf state on the internal issues of Sudan, specifically after the revolution, which is this is, is a create like a public opinion against this kind of interference. So I think from the political analysis that even in the newspaper, that if you check the Sudanese newspaper, also there are some position, it start to be concretely against this and putting the, 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 the national interests of Sudan on the top of this, because the interference is very clear. The last point that I want to mention it, which is that I collected from the information that I had through the interviews with the, the expert people that Sudan, even in 2015, when al-Bashir uh, signed the agreement, this joint agreement between Ethiopia and Sudan, the government of Sudan at that time also was not based this kind of position or the signature of this agreement on any kind of technical advice. So until now, the gap, even there is a, is a, is a literature review carried by the University of Khartoum, one of the independent institution that 
working on the issue of the dam from a technical perspective, carried out this literature review, we have a huge gap in determining the, the, the environmental and socioeconomic impact on the dam on Sudan, which is this is also make the position of Sudan very lousy. And if I, what I, what I say before is a subjective position, I don't think so that I'm, I'm going extremely, if I des describe the position of Sudan as a subjective, subjective position. Thank you very much. Thank you, Akram. So uh, really, uh, Anna and the team, if you need to clarify something. Yes, um, I would like to point um, to two things. The first thing is um, about um, what Meret said she wasn't clear about um, removing the, the guard from the discussion. So while I think you cannot, um, we cannot remove the guard from the discussion because, I mean, as you said, it's the guard uses the water from the Nile. The guard is located by the Nile. But the thing is, from an Ethiopian perspective, putting the guard as part of the negotiation is like um, it's like a, a question then rises up: Why is our development agenda on the table of negotiations dealing with other countries? So that is a balance that um, the Ethiopian government and perhaps all other stakeholders will have to address. Because I can understand that over 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 the years, um, if um, there's if we if we need to make a decision on development and it's supposed to bring this benefit that benefit, why should we have to negotiate its possibility? But at the same time, the nature of the guard itself, there is absolutely no way you will talk about the Nile and its waters without discussing the guard. Then secondly, is um it's more of um um, um an encourage um. I would like to just encourage anyone that is studying on this to bear in mind that countries don't choose their neighbors, um, but they can choose how they interact with them, the depth of the interaction, and um, how successful the interaction would be. So um, it would mean that if um, such discussions have not been uh, in time past at trilateral level, it probably means that um, so that we won't ha be having a dialogue of two depths, we would need to um, perhaps devise um, alternative means, or let me say innovative means rather, innovative means is more appropriate, to address the, the question on the guard when we are talking about Egypt, Sudan, or Ethiopia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Timmy. Anna, over to you. Okay, I promise that I'm very brief because I want to go back to the beginning and something that uh, Lorenzo has said, and I think it's very important, which has to do with the Ukrainian war. I mean, we cannot forget that these countries, and I'm talking about Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia, are dependent on the wheat produced in Ukraine and Russia. And uh, Egypt already used 35 billion cubic meters of virtual water coming with cereals. So food security in Egypt doesn't depend on the matter. And Sudan has the potential, this is just to add up, and Sudan has the potential to produce a lot of cereals, it, the so-called uh, bread basket, and I think Akram in his presentation mentioned that, that could somehow, <clears throat> I mean, fulfill the gaps that we will fill in Egypt and in the other two countries as a food uh, producer. So I think we should not forget that, that the Nile can be for the development of the countries, but not necessarily in the ways we have been thinking about it. So we should go out of the box that we need an agreement that has allocations, et cetera, et cetera, to go a bit broader and understand that there is solutions available. It's just like not the most obvious. Thank you, Francesca, for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, so uh, I would like to thank a lot Daniela Huber, uh, Lorenzo Kammer, uh, Nicolò Russo Perez, Stefano De Martino, Christian Greco, um, and our distinguished speakers. So Miret Mabruk, uh, Timi Akamo, uh, Akram Abbas, and uh, Anna Cascao. And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, Nathalie Champion for having uh, organized everything. And uh, uh, also, uh, I would like to thank the Compagnia di San Paolo and the Italian Foreign Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, for financing our project. Thank you very much to everyone and have a nice day.